Good afternoon. So I'm the law professor. No PowerPoint. Text. Lots of it. But I'm going to start by talking about computer engineers. And there's a standard joke about computer engineers that's very short. It goes like this. Two computer engineers are hired by a company to develop an information system. On the first day of the job, the one engineer says to the other, you start programming, I'll go find out what they want. The joke is both funny, as some of you have seen, but it's also a bit sad. And maybe the, the sad aspect has more purchase given that there wasn't a lot of laughter. And I personally also find the joke a bit sad because it hints at the way in which we've become hostage to technocratic processes, the, the, the routines of the computer engineering community. So in that sense, the joke is really on all of us. The joke can also be seen as symbolic for parts of AI development, a development in which some of the coders of AI have been motivated more by an abiding fascination for the technically sweet than perhaps the societally good. Or they have equated the technically sweet with the societally good. And this is troubling. In saying this, I don't want to denigrate the motivations of large parts of the AI development community who want to improve the quality of life for humanity, who want to enhance progress in understanding and combating very, very serious societal problems, combating disease, improving the delivery of services and the like. But as we've seen from the history of certain tech startups, pursuit of the technically sweet does not necessarily equate with the societally good. In the first place, there are those in the tech industry who have a rather narrow self-serving view of the uh, societally good, and even those who start off with an intention, do no evil, often experience that their noble vision gets corrupted by profiteering imperatives. And then we've got the cowboys, the cowboys who just love living, according to the motto, move fast and break things. Now, breaking things can sometimes be good, but as you all, I think, understand, it can also be bad or let's say suboptimal from a broader societal perspective. Now, why do I say all of this? I say it because this is some of the background for the enactment early this year by the European Union of its AI Act, a regulation that came into force officially on the 1st of August, so just over a month ago. And in effect, what Brussels is telling the coders and deployers of AI is before you start programming or before you start deploying a system, go find out what the AI Act requires or encourages you to do and do it, particularly if you want to have your products, the results of your efforts, put on the European market. That's, that's the AI act in the most simple way uh, that, that, that it can be sort of described as. Very basic message. But the message is more broadly targeted than that because the EU, in effect, is talking to the rest of the world. And it's saying, look to Brussels, not look to Norway, look to Brussels for global leadership in ensuring secure, trustworthy, human-centric AI systems that respect fundamental rights, that are in effect deferential to human control according to the vision that Stuart Russell talked about earlier today. And this is part of the EU's self-conscious projection of itself as a normative superpower. So if it can't com out-compete the China and the USA in the so-called AI arms race, it definitely thinks it can outcompete them in terms of regulatory capacity. And let's face it, the AI Act is massive. 113 
operative provisions, we call articles in legal speak, a preamble made up of 180 paragraphs, or recitals in legal speak, 13 annexes. On top of that, we're going to have harmonized standards, codes of practice, and perhaps codes of conduct. So, text, 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 talk, talk, talk. Much of it dense with tortuous syntax, much of it nebulous being the product of compromise. Even the Act's definition of an AI system, which is a cornerstone concept for the Act, is awash with ambiguity. And adding to these challenges is the Act's procedural intricacy, with large swathes of provisions dedicated to the organisation of oversight, enforcement, competence and risk management. And while important, as you can appreciate, such provisions are going to engender a massive amount of red tape. Somewhat perversely, this is a lawyer's wet dream. The AI Act is yet another piece of full employment legislation for the legal profession. It offers the prospect of thousands and thousands of hours billable for advice. So talk of AI eroding the power of the legal profession is somewhat premature, at least for those in the profession who are setting themselves up as the new high priests to elucidate AI law for the masses. We must also remember that the AI Act is just one element of the EU's regulatory regime for artificial intelligence. Numerous other pieces of legislation are also part of that regime. GDPR, everyone heard of that? Digital Services Act, some of you probably. Data Act, Data Governance Act, Digital Markets Act, Machine Regulation, the General Product Safety Regulation, and the upcoming Cyber Resilience Act. They're just some of what you have to navigate in the digital sphere or underneath the AI sun. And in addition, you've got the EU's constitutional framework for protecting fundamental rights, which is also going to set limits on AI deployment. And many of these regulatory elements are also full employment legislation for people like myself. And elucidating their meaning is challenging, but equally challenging, in fact, some, in some ways more challenging, I'm finding, is working out how they all fit together. So e the interconnections are really difficult to navigate properly. It's like putting together pieces of a huge jigsaw puzzle with all of the pieces varying shades of green. And the picture that emerges is not of a well-kempt forest, it's a jungle. And this underscores the fact that regulatory capacity, you know, the ability to make rules, isn't necessarily going to generate optimal regulatory coherence, nor does it necessarily generate understandability. And this last point is really important to bear in mind when we start to consider how the AI Act is going to walk the walk. In other words, when we start to consider how policy talk will be put into practice. And if that policy talk doesn't communicate clearly with the persons and organisations that are expected to do the walking, it's going to be difficult to galvanise them in the direction that Brussels wishes. And frankly, the complexity and vagueness of the AI Act's legalese, combined with its Byzantine intricacy, is paradoxically akin to a form of black box decision making that the Act is supposed to remedy. And we've got to remember that the tech world and the law world, they are worlds apart. It's not just that they have different languages, different cultures, but their actions and, let's say, opportunity horizons are often out of sync. Typically, law tries to catch up with technological change. It's often ridiculed for not being ahead of the game, for being slow-moving, obstinate, and out of touch. And if law does make a real attempt to get ahead, then it's criticised for being 
again, out of touch with economic reality, for placing a clammy hand on innovation, productivity. So there's a bind here. And um, with the AI Act, the EU is definitely trying to outpace technology. So, understandably, uh, Brussels has copped a lot of flack for potentially undermining the ability of the European AI industry to keep up with their competitors elsewhere. Anyway, I do take off my proverbial hat to the legislators for the ambition and cleverness with which they have pursued their task. They've tried to tackle basically everything under the AI sun. Not just the risky usual suspects like deep fakes, social scoring, subliminal techniques for manipulation, predictive policing. They've also got those more sort of softer, vaguer matters addressed as well, perhaps somewhat weakly, such as AI literacy, environmental sustainability, and gender equality. And there have been attempts to future-proof the legislation using generic terminology. But the attempt to outpace technology is always fraught with risk. There may be developments that come to us like lightning out of blue sky, and that the law does not address sensibly, even if the law is in theory applicable. We saw this a couple of years ago when the fruits of work on large language models uh, emerged into the public sphere in the form of chat GPT and the like, and caused amazement and consternation. Now, this happened in the middle of the drafting of the AI Act. The 2021 proposal for the Act had nothing around chat GPT and the like, large language models, or at least not, nothing specific. And, and the, the legislators had to re-scramble their efforts in a short time frame to include new provisions on what the Act terms general purpose AI. To conclude, some brief remarks on the, AI's act, on the AI Act's ability to box the boxes. To begin with, it's important to note that the thrust of the Act is directed at containing the detrimental consequences of unacceptable and high-risk AI, not systems of lesser risk. Indeed, low-risk systems, the minimal-risk systems, they're largely left unaddressed apart from an encouragement that industry actors develop soft law standards for these in the form of codes of conduct. As for mid-level risk systems, including general purpose AI, these are largely subject to transparency and explainability requirements. But for the more risky systems, there are a large number of requirements that try to bite properly into the development and design of these systems and not just after the systems are made. And this is very positive. But there's precious little detail on some of these requirements. For example, there are rules on human oversight, which are going to be really important for shoring up our cognitive sovereignty, in other words, our moral entitlement to understand the world around us. But the Act doesn't address things like, well, who are going to be the overseers? What sort of competence are they to have? How much independence are they to have? So with these sorts of matters left hanging in the air, there is a possibility that the boxing will end up as shadow boxing, punching the air, mimicking combat, but not really landing any punches. However, I am, at the end of the day, a sceptical optimist. Paradox? I live with paradoxes. We all do. Uh, the AI Act is here to stay. It's not going away. We need to understand it. It's going to be important, it, not least for framing the way in which we see the world, the way in which we tackle AI systems. And it's going to have consequences here in Norway because it will become appended to the agreement on European economic area and thus directly applicable in Norwegian law. And as those of you who have had the chance to look at the report issued by the National Audit Office on Monday have seen, there are a large number of legal issues to be addressed at home as well. And we will only be able to address those in the light of the AI Act. Thank you.